Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome today in the morning at this early hour. Uh, so today, I'll, I'll try to give a I'll try to give a somewhat mini course style talk on on a recent result, and uh, it's the first time I'm doing this, so I should say that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how much of the slides I will cover. There are slides online, which I'm actually going to use for, for the mini course itself myself. So the slides online are, if you Google my name, they're on the website. You go to publications, you go to the very bottom of the page. Uh, how to use the slides? The slides, there are 50 slides. Maybe in the mini course itself, we're going to cover 10 or 15. The rest are, uh, well, proofs of stuff that I will skip during the course or exercises or, well, go to the slides and, and uh, see. Uh, maybe afterwards because you don't want to read 50 slides and watch the course at the same time, I think. Uh, but the slides are also on Big Blue Button and every once in a while I can tell you what uh, slide we're, we're on. Uh, all right, so as I said, I will talk, as, as Guillaume said, uh, I will talk about uh, multicritical sure measures and unitary matrix models. And I will start with the, I will start with the unitary matrix models side of the story first. But actually, before I start, let me just briefly give you the result. And the way this talk is going to go, I will give you three versions of a result in increasing order of complexity. And... Uh, so the last result I'll attribute, I'll attribute to, uh, the last version I'll attribute to myself, Jeremy Boutier and Harriet Walsh, and it's uh, recent from, from 2010. But until then, uh, I will just state it as a theorem. Uh, so the first version of the result is, uh, is this. Uh, so I'll state the result and I'll explain everything inside and uh, prove it afterwards. So let me just state it. So you pick a natural number, n, and you pick a vector of real numbers. Uh, you pick a vector of real numbers, that's going to be weird. So the vector is going to have odd components non-zero and exactly n of them. So you pick n real numbers, you call them theta 1, theta 3, theta 2, and minus 1. With these real numbers, you construct a polynomial, essentially the generating polynomial of these guys. Um, z to the power i. Uh, so theta i is of degree i, essentially, so I put a z to the, z to the i next to it. And simply because it's going to be uh, faster to write it than sometimes, if I take v of z plus v of z inverse, I want to call that another function, v tilde of z plus z inverse. So this you can always do because this is symmetric under z goes to z inverse. Uh, by the way, People in random matrices usually call this guy the potential. Well, either this or this, it's, it's a matter of uh, preference. Okay, so, so you pick n and then these numbers, which you assemble into that polynomial. So here's the result. The following are equal. So first, First, you will see a probability measure, which I denote like this. And, uh, okay, let me just write it down. Uh, Exponential sum 
theta i squared over i. Uh, is so I have four quantities and they're all equal and the last quantity is an expectation over the unitary group of exponential trace uh, so maybe I want here u And then I still have to divide by this guy. All right, so this is the result. So you have four quantities here, none of which I've defined. But let's start from the back. So the back you have expectation over the unitary group of a certain e to the trace of a polynomial in u plus u inverse, u star. Uh, so you can, if you've seen random matrices at all, you can kind of guess what this is. This is not too, uh, this is not too uh, hard to explain either. So this is a, I should say, uh, sorry, this is L here. Uh, so L is a number, L is an integer in case that's not obvious, since it's also the dimension of the unitary group. So this is a Toeplitz determinant, L by L. It's a bit uh, messy here, but it, 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 it means it's uh, L by L. And uh, let me tell you what, uh, what FKs are. So the FKs, You get them uh, from their Fourier series. Uh, so they're the Fourier coefficients of uh, this guy. These are the FKs. And I should say maybe this is improperly written. So what you should really write is I'll write it and then I'll erase it. So fk is integral over the unit circle of e to the b tilde of z plus z inverse, z to the k, dz over 2 pi i z. So this is what I, what people normally mean by this. I will only write this. I will almost never remember to write uh, the longer form. So you have this. So as I said, E is expectation with respect to power measure on the unitary group UL. And uh, This is sure measure. All right, so I still haven't explained what this is, and I still really haven't told you explicitly what the expectation is. So I'm gonna do that next. So all you know so far is that this is a Teplis determinant, and it's a particularly uh, explicit one. Uh, you get the fj's by expanding uh, e to the f e to the v of z plus v of z, z inverse in, in the Fourier series. Uh, so I realize that my handwriting is a bit of a mess, so I have to erase, of course. Uh, well, let me tell you what expectation of, of the unitary group is, and I will uh, conclude with telling you what sure measure is. And then we'll prove it. Uh, so what is this guy? So the unitary group is of course a compact group. You have a unique probability measure on it, which is called Haar measure. Uh, people denote it by du, I guess. And, uh, and this guy only depends on the 
on the eigenvalues because you have the trace, so you have e to the trace of v of u plus u inverse, or v tilde, which is v of u plus v of u inverse. Uh, since this only depends on the eigenvalues, you want to uh, push forward this measure to the eigenvalues. And it turns out you can do this computation explicitly. I will not do it for you here, but uh, I, give a, a, I give at least one, uh, one reference in, in the notes. It's a Jacobian computation. Uh, so on eigenvalues, Let's call the eigenvalues z1 up to zl. On eigenvalues z1 up to zl, the measure that you get is the following. There is a 1 over l factorial and then there is a product a Vandermont product, uh, ZA minus ZB squared, A less than B. And then there's a, and the L dimensional torus measure, so 2 pi I. I should say these eigenvalues all have modulus 1 because it's a unitary matrix. Uh, so then the expectation, Uh, where should I write it? Okay. Let me write it here. So the expectation on unitary group of that thing, exponential of trace of uh, v, v tilde u plus u inverse, is just n-dimensional integral over the unitary group, uh, well, of what I wrote here times, times that guy. So, uh, so it's the Vandermont squared, and then you have product over A, uh, everything ranges from 1 to L. Uh, product over A, uh, E to the V tilde ZA plus ZA inverse. Uh, DZA over 2 pi I ZA. Uh, all right. So at least now you have two, two sides of the story defined. And uh, this identity in the literature is usually called Heine's identity. Let's see, so... Okay, so you have expectation over the unitary group, you have a template determinant, I have to define what this is. And for this, I will need to erase because I will need to, uh, uh, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll erase actually everything below the result. We only have one blackboard, so I'm not exactly sure uh, that there's no... Okay, so I'll, I'll erase... So I'll erase here. So what's P? What's this uh, short measure? So first of all, it's a measure on partitions. What are partitions? So partition, la lambda, is uh, maybe I should use my notes to see what example I gave. Uh, I guess four to one. So a partition is just a uh, 
non-increasing sequence of finitely many non-zero integers. So 4 to 1, for example. Uh, so lambda 1 is uh, 4. It's the first part. The length of lambda is the number of non-zero. Well, you can think of this as uh, having infinitely many zeros training at the end. So the length of lambda is just the number of non-zero numbers. It's 3. And uh, so that's a partition. What you see here is L of lambda and lambda 1. And this measure is a measure on partitions. And uh, it's called sure measure. And let me just define it directly and then explain what the components are. Uh, so it's a measure on partitions. And then you're looking at two of its uh, uh, extremal statistics. Why extremal statistics? Well. 4 to 1, so 4 is the maximum of these numbers. The partition, you always write a partition in decreasing order. So uh, a partition, you can also always write it as a Young diagram. And it actually turns out that it's useful to write the. This is 4, 3, 1, 4, 2, 1. Uh, that's correct. This is 4 to 1. Uh, thank you, Guillaume, for pointing that out. Uh, so if you rotate this picture, you get another partition. Uh, that's called the conjugate partition. It's denoted by lambda prime in the nodes and in the literature in general. And uh, so it's going to look like this. So it's 3, 2, 1, 1. The mask is not very good. Uh, and notice, so this is the this is lambda one, and this is the length of lambda. So there's a symmetry between the two. So and the length of lambda is really the first part, the extremal part of uh, lambda one. So this is the notation. Now let me give you the definition of sure measure. So it's a probability measure. Well, you always start by the normalizing constant, and. Uh, And then you have a product of two sure functions. And in my case, they're going to be evaluated at uh, the same set of parameters, theta. Recall that theta is just a set of n parameters, theta 1, theta 3, up to theta 2, and minus 1. OK, but, but now I have to define these guys. Um, so these guys are actually triplets minors. Now you kind of think that, OK, you have tuplets here, you have tuplets minors here. Isn't that the same? It, well, it actually is. But, uh, and I'll prove that in a second. But let me define what these are. Uh, so this is a determinant. 1 less than or equal to ij less than or equal to uh, less than or equal to, I don't remember whether I want M or N here. What do the notes say? N. Good. Uh, of numbers H sub lambda I minus I plus J of theta. And N here is bigger than or equal than the length of lambda. And it's also a determinant 1 less than or equal to ij less than or equal to uh, m. m is greater than or equal to lambda 1 of e of these numbers. So it's a determinant of numbers. You kind of see this is a tuplet minor. Well, not quite, but if you reverse rows and columns, it turns out it is. Um, and let me tell you what these numbers are. So these numbers are, well, I can write them explicitly in terms of theta. I'd rather give a more mysterious definition. They're generating series, if you want. Uh, 
hk k greater than or equal to zero hk of uh, theta uh, z to the k is just exponential sum i greater than or equal to one well, we have a name for it actually, and it's still on the board, luckily. Uh, exponential of v of z. So take exponential of this guy, expand it, and these are the h's. Uh, for the other numbers, it turns out it's a bit more cumbersome to write them. But it turns out in this case they're the same. So this is exponential, and now I have to write this down properly. Uh, theta i over i z to the i, i greater than or equal to 1. So the e's are the exponentials, it's not quite v, it's v where you put a, a minus sign, depending on the degree, in front of each coefficient. Uh, several remarks. All that I'm saying so far works for arbitrary, even infinitely arbitrary vectors uh, theta, even with infinitely many non-zero entries, as long as, let's say, this guy converges. Has a has a positive radius of convergence. Uh, but because I chose theta this way, and I only chose it basically so that this whole thing simplifies, because I chose theta this way, that you only have uh, odd ones that are non-zero, well, this is always even. So the sign cancels here. So in this case, these numbers are the same. But that's just because I, I chose uh, theta, theta like this. And really, if I, if I would have chosen a more generic theta, then this result would split into two different results, each with the three quantities that are equal to each other. Uh, I decided to simplify. It makes life nicer. Also, there's not so much time to, to write everything down. Uh, so these are sure functions. Sure functions are Teplitz minors. Quick question. Yes. Uh, so these uh, generating functions, they define the hk and the ek for any k larger than uh, any, any non-negative k? Uh, yes. In the determinant, you need also the negative ones? Yes, 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 you're absolutely right. So e k, uh, e k, e, uh, okay, let's write it like this. e k equals h k equals zero for k less than zero. And e0 is equal to 1. Uh, yes, by, yeah. So in the determinant, you will indeed find non-zero things. Uh, sorry, uh, things where this is 0. And this is sort of the magic that uh, tells you that you can take this determinant as big as you want. As Well, this determinant is, is n by n, and n can be really anything that's bigger than the, than the length of this partition. Uh, you can sort of think of this as a Slater determinant for physicists, if you know what that is. But it's so my the analogy that I have in my head is not very clear because it's a sl Slater determinant on the energy levels rather than the positions, if you want. Uh, so so this this would be your state, I suppose. Well, in any case, I don't want to make too many remarks on the on the physicality of this determinant because it's it's beyond my area of uh, of expertise let's say how to think of this as a slater determinant but and i also haven't thought about this uh, haven't prepared this in the course probably i should have thought, thought of, about it a bit more but nonetheless so these are sure functions uh templates minors and so these are the marginals of the first part and the length of the of the of the partition. Uh, let's see. So it's been 
25 minutes and I think I need to change my mask because it keeps falling off my face for some reason. I've never tried to give a course with a mask before, so... Uh, and also want to drink a little bit of water. So we're still just at the very definition, so maybe we're, we're around slide uh, 5 or 6. So I'll disappear from the camera for 30 seconds. And then we'll start proving this, uh, this chain of equalities. Not sure if this works. All right, so uh, can you still hear? Okay. Uh, I changed my mask, but I'm not sure the, the new one is any better. Uh, uh, okay, so where was I? So uh, we will like to start with proving this. Having defined uh, all of these uh, all of these things, we will prove this first. And this is actually an easy proof. Well, actually, none of the proofs are, are very complicated. They just involve some uh, manipulations with determinants uh, of various degrees of uh, difficulty. Uh, Yeah, so let's start proving this. I will erase the definition, unfortunately. Because for some reason I still want to keep the result on the board. I don't know why I insist on this, but maybe I should write it in the corner somehow. something like this. Well, I can... Uh, one second, I mask issues again. Uh, the way it works is you can actually do it by hand. And you should try to do it by hand. For example, for, let's see, L equals 2 or L equals 3, it's not too difficult to do it by hand, and then you convince yourself that you can do it in the general case. So let me tell you how to do it in the general case. And it's... Uh, you use an identity that's usually called uh, Andreev identity. Uh, Uh, sadly, in the notes, I think I do it backwards. I think I start with this equality, but okay, you can find out uh, about this in the notes. So, uh, use the following identity, which you can actually prove by hand just by expanding determinants. So, you have an L fold integral. over the unit circle. Well, actually, 
No, over, let me write it in general, over a space x. And here you have two determinants, phi of uh, phi i of zk, or uh, all are l by l, so, so uh, i and k range from 1 to l. Psi j of zk uh, is equal to determinant integral over x psi i of z uh, well I guess it doesn't matter but so this is a determinant in jk this is in ik and then I, I guess this is in ij Here quite often when you play with determinants, and uh, arguably they're sort of the only identities you have at your disposal when you when you deal with uh, with such objects. And uh, so here we have a determinant. That's why that's why I was thinking of this. And uh, well, now let's just see how this works. There should be an L factorial here. So to see how this works, I have to tell you what X is. So X is just a unit circle, just uh, Z equals one. D mu of z is just uh, not like that. Uh, dz over 2 by iz. A phi, phi of i is uh, I guess I want z i minus 1 e to the v of z and psi, psi j of z is z to the 1 minus j, so essentially the, the transpose. Well, okay, I don't want to say the transpose, but e to the v of z inverse. And uh, that's it. Well, why? Uh, so, so let's see what's uh, what's happening here. So, if you put these things together, what do you get here? So, you get the determinant of e to the v plus v inverse plus v of z plus v of z inverse, and then z to the j minus i, so 1 over z to the, sorry, 1 over z to the j minus i. So the right hand side is just the determinant of f j minus i. Because recall the definition was that f j z k, f's are just the Fourier coefficients of this. And what do you get on the right-hand side? Well, on the right-hand side, you actually get the expectation over the unitary group of, uh, of all that times L factorial. Because I, re I recall that that expectation had a 1 over L factorial. Uh, here, you don't get any L factorial, so you, you get uh, the L factorial here. It actually matches nicely with the, 
Well, there is an alpha factorial here as well, of course, this guy. Matches nicely with this. And this is not too hard to see. I mean, these terms, when you put a zi here and a zk, they only depend on the row inside the determinant or the column, so you take them out. Uh, so they're going to be a univariate product. And then here you have two Vandermon determinants. You know how to evaluate those. And they turn out to give uh, something like this. Uh, ZA minus ZB, 1 over ZA minus 1 over ZB. Uh, when you evaluate the determinant of just this guy and this guy. So that's exactly the determinant A less than B. So this is exactly the product that you want. This is uh, ZA minus ZB squared. Well, uh, because the ZA and ZB, of course, are of modulus 1. Uh, so that's it. I mean, there's nothing more than this. And actually, this, this identity is not very hard to prove. You, you just prove it by hand. You expand this in terms of uh, permutations. You realize that all the integrals are kind of, uh, well, are equal. Uh, you get an L factorial. And then you do a bit more... Uh, you try to push essentially whatever is here inside this determinant, and then you get this determinant. Well, you have to realize at some point that the only integration that fall, uh, you can do integration row-wise, so you push the integrals inside the determinant. Again, try to prove this for L equals 2 or L equals 3, and uh, you will see what happens very, very fast. Uh, okay, so that's it. So Heine's identity is almost well, it's this identity in disguise, uh, and it's not too bad to prove. So now I will show you uh, this identity. So uh, we've proven that. I will have to erase. And now I will uh, prove this identity. And. Uh, Again, this is a general proof. At, at no point so far have I used anything specific about V, so about the sequence theta, about the, the vector theta. The only place where I, I'll use it is here, as well, as I sort of said before. Uh, so with the generic theta, I would just not have this equality, and writing the result would, be, would take twice as long as writing this one. So let me erase everything except the result. If you're having uh, trouble following, uh, this is of course in the notes. So the notes go into many interludes. The interludes are written if you're looking at the colored screen and not at the black and uh, uh, white uh, printout. The interludes are, are, are written in gray so that you don't read them at first pass. Uh, because they sort of go into more depth and they, they go on various uh, tangential points that are somewhat important. Uh, and also because I, I won't have time to cover any of the interludes in, uh, in the course. So, uh, this identity Okay, so proof of let me call the whatever the equality, let me call it, well, I put a, an arrow here, so proof of arrow. So what you have to prove is this. Uh, so you sum over all partitions lambda of length uh, less than or equal to L. You want to you want to prove this. And uh, so you, I, I showed you an identity before that's called the Andreev identity. Well, it turns out the Andreev identity has a... I'm not sure the... The sister, a brother, maybe, maybe a, well, a sibling, let's say. 
called the Koshibin identity, which is actually older, which is just an Andreev identity in uh, written with counting measures, so, so in discrete form. And uh, so for that, I will probably want to use the nodes. So uh, let's see. So let me tell you. Yeah. So let me tell you the setup. So you have uh, you have two matrices. A I J. Uh, So this is written explicitly in the notes. So you have one matrix, which is L times infinity. So it has infinitely many columns and finally many rows. Uh, if you're worried about infinity, everything converges. I'll try to explain this at the end. Uh, you have another matrix that's infinity times L. So A times B, when you multiply them together, that's going to be L times L. And what's A? So A is uh, IJ, and here I need the nodes because it's usually backwards. So the way I wrote it, A is just B transposed. And it actually turns out that if you have such a matrices, this is, this is even on Wikipedia and possibly with a proof. But the proof is more or less similar to what I said before about the continuous identity. So determinant of A times B, A times B is L times L, so uh, the determinant makes sense, is equal to sum over, I'll explain over what in a second, Determinant AL, determinant BL. Uh, so what's L? L are sequences of this form. Uh, I guess sets. L1 less than L2. Uh, let me put big letters. L1 less than L2 less than less than big L. Uh, and now my sins come and haunt me because I have big L and then index little L. And this is slash, this is slash ELL -L in latte. That's, I hope I don't have to use the other L. Uh, so such, identi such an identity always holds. What's AL? AL is this matrix, A, where you picked out L columns little l columns indexed by this set. Likewise with bl, but with bl you do it with uh, you do it with the rows. And this more or less implies this. How do you see it? So on the right hand side, you see you have determinants of h's. And essentially if you write L i minus i equals lambda L plus 1 minus i. Uh, so you have to do some weird gymnastics. You want to write these guys. So these guys are increasing. The lambs are, lambdas are decreasing as the index increases. So you want to do something like this. This has length at, at, length at most L. So all of this makes sense. Uh, You, uh, you write the right-hand side like this, and then you have to reverse rows and columns to actually find the definition of short functions, but that's not too difficult. So uh, that's how you see that the right-hand sides, well, that's how you see that this matches this.
To see that this matches this, well, you just write A, B, I, J is just, uh, well, you do matrix multiplication, and then you resum, and then you get, uh, how did I write it? I wrote it like this. So sum over K, H, K minus I plus J of theta, H, K of theta. Well, you get, essentially you get hk minus i, hk minus j, but then you resum, you say k minus j is the new k, and, and uh, you get this. This is, uh, you can sum over all k's here, in z actually. But of course these are zero as soon as this is negative, and this is negative, so this is, a, this is bounded from below. Uh, and now I want to find some space so this is a this is a triplet element. It only depends on the j minus i. And what you want to do is compute the symbol. So to compute the symbol means, you know, j minus i. You you write it as an s, and then you sum over s. And uh, so that's the symbol of this triplet uh, triplet entry uh, by definition. And uh, I'm trying to figure out, maybe I'll erase this. So what's, so to compute the symbol, what did I say? I said hk minus plus j minus i. So I guess I, I'll write here plus s. So I'm doing uh, j minus i is equal to s. Uh, and then I'm summing over all S's, of course, that's what I want to do. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm putting the sum next to it, slash no limits in LaTeX for some reason. That's what I did in the notes, but uh, it seems that I'm doing it in real life as well. Um, HK. And then... Uh, z to the s, so I'm summing over s, that's the symbol. Let me check that you can still see, yes, there's a z to the s here. And now z to the s is just z to the k plus s minus k. And now you can do the two sums independently, z to the k plus s, and uh, z to the negative k, and Recall that the sum of the, the generating series for the H's, this, this was the definition, is e to the v. So this is e to the v of z, which you get by summing over k plus s, e to the v of uh, 1 over z, which you get by summing over k, because you have a negative k here. So this is exactly, by definition again, e to the v of z plus z inverse. Uh, so I use some sort of cauchy binelli called Andreev identity here. I use the same identity here, except uh, the discrete version. And again, this, this identity you can prove by hand. Uh, it's not too difficult. Now here you have infinitely many uh, columns, and here you have infinitely many rows, but if the Rows and columns are all in little l2, which they are as soon as this guy is convergent. Uh, you can still, the proof still follows. So uh, the proof still holds. I mean, the identity still holds. All right. So uh, now I want to prove this guy. And this guy more or less proved at the beginning. When I told you that the E numbers and the H numbers, because of the sign properties, because I only chose uh, odd things here to be non-zero, are the same. So the so let me say uh, a bit about that. I'll of course have to erase all of this.
There are other ways of proving this last equality. Uh, okay, so it's like a tape. You have a tape head that moves and reads. It's a bit like a Turing machine. Uh, okay, so proof of uh, of uh, error. There was, a, there was a question in the chat. Uh, so the denominator exponential of sum of theta I squared over i, wh where does it come from? Ah, yes, yes. Uh, it's a good question. So it's in the notes, but of course I, I forgot it. <laughs> Possibly because I couldn't see through the glasses at that time. Yeah, so this is the partition function. So recall that... Uh, uh, P of n theta O is uh, of lambda is equal to S lambda of theta S lambda of theta. So, and I said you divide by z. I, in fact, started by dividing by z, but I did not tell you what z is. Well, z is exactly that. Yes, so this I forgot. And that's, that, that's exactly what we've proven in the previous step. We've proven that this guy is equal to this guy because the denominators just cancel. So the denominator is embedded into the probability, but here you have to put it by hand. Uh, yeah, this and this are, of course, the same. And... Uh, Okay, small interlude. How do you see that the sum over all lambdas of this guy is equal to this? Well, by now you should not be surprised that you can use Cauchy Binet again, except not quite in the in the form that I showed you, and I won't have time to, to actually prove it. But but it's in the interludes. It's uh, I think it's called something proving the partition function formula. So it's on slide nine or ten. It's, it's a similar computation to what we've done, but you have to be a little bit more careful. You have to take a limit. So indeed, this is not obvious that this, this is a probability measure. But, uh, but the proof is, uh, is the same. So that's where the denominator comes from. OK, so, so now I want to erase. Uh, So, so we're proving this. So you can use Cauchy Binet with, uh, let me call it the E formula for sure functions. And then what you get is the following. Sum over lambda, lambda one less than or equal to L, so not the length, but the, the first part. S lambda of uh, theta. S lambda of theta is, is a tuplice determinant, but now the symbol is going to be different because, because you're using it with the E formula. So the E formula was somewhere on this blackboard at some point. So let me just tell you what the symbol is. So the symbol, if you do the computations, is just this guy. So sum minus 1 to the i minus 1 uh, theta i over i. And then you have z to the i plus z to the negative i. And this is the only place where it pays dividends to have chosen theta to only have uh, odd degrees. I mean, to, to only be non-zero in odd degree and actually to only have one, uh, well, it's a polynomial, but you could do this with a series as well. 
Because this is the same as e to the v of z plus z inverse. Which means that fk is equal to gk. Where fk, so fk is the Fourier coefficient of, of this guy. gk is the Fourier coefficient of this guy. Well, i minus 1 is always even, so the sign disappears. Which means that you get the same Kepler determinant in the end, so which means that these two are equal. Uh, this is the only place where such a thing is needed, and I only chose it because it makes life easier. And I have to write less. Uh, so proving this is the same as proving this, and then realizing uh, this sign cancellation at the end. And uh, that's it. So, uh, so that proves everything, this chain of equalities. So now it, I have another half an hour left. So I will erase this. Uh, again, it's all in the notes. So, so if you, uh, well, this is recorded and it will appear online at some point. And uh, if not, it's all in the notes which are available online and which are supposed to excuse my, my uh, handling with the blackboard. So the theorem, I'm still not sure whether I should put my name to it, but you can see, so for example, if, this is certainly explicit in uh, our, our paper with uh, Jagami Boutier and Harriet Walsh. So C B B W twenty. All the references are in the notes. Uh, well, the statement is, is the same, except I'll add another equality, and all equal to a threshold determinant uh, on the space. I have to do a little L2 space, but of course L is taken already, so let's pretend that this is mat frac or something. Uh, so on the space little L2 of L plus one half, L plus three halves. And that, let me tell you, let me tell you what this is. So k of a b is an operator. So it's an infinite, it's a z times z matrix. So it's an operator on little l2 of, of, of this guy. Uh, well, little l2 of z a priori, but uh, here you just take the determinant of on little l2 of this space, which is still infinite dimensional. Uh, So, uh, one over two pi i squared, dz over two pi i z, uh, no, dz over z, dw over w. So this already tells you that this is going to be uh, k a b is going to be the Fourier coefficient of something. Uh, w is less than z. And they're both around uh, zero, so, well, let me write it like this. W is uh, 1 minus epsilon, Z is 1 plus epsilon. So, circles of radius 1 minus epsilon and 1 plus epsilon. Epsilon is small. Uh, e of V of Z minus V of Z inverse over E of V of uh, W mi uh, minus V of W inverse. Notice that there's a minus here, not a plus like uh, above. Uh, Z to the W to the B over Z to the A and square root of ZW over Z minus W.
Uh, this is k, and uh, so first, yeah. So 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 where does this come from? There is no actual time to prove this. There are ten slides at the end that actually prove this formula. So at the end of the slides, at the very end, you'll have an appendix that actually proves this formula more or less from scratch. It comes from the following two statements. Well, so this is roughly... Okay, so this is a result of Opunkov, uh, 2001, I suppose. Which says that such measures are determinantal. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, it means that the probability, so recall that these measures are probability, are measures on partitions, and then we're looking at the marginal of the first part and the length. It means that the probability, I'll write it in words, of lambda having particles at uh, position ki, 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to n, so you fix n positions, ki, and then you ask for lambda having a particle at that position. Now, I haven't told you what that is, and uh, I'll draw a picture in a second. So this is the theorem of Okunkov. It means that it's exactly k of, uh, let me make this small case, ki and small kj. 1 less than or equal to i, j less than or equal to n. And uh, so that's statement number one. And then statement number two, here you have probability of the biggest part is less than or equal to L. That's usually that's called a gap probability. That means you have no particles beyond L. And statement number two is a generic statement that whenever you have such processes, which are called determinantal point processes, meaning the endpoint correlation functions are determinants, uh, whenever you have such processes, the gap probability is a fret home determinant. So that's a generic statement. So, I have to define a few things. So first let me tell you what, what it means for lambda to have a particle at, uh, at a certain position. Well, it turns out that you can draw a partition in so-called Russian notation, and let me see how I'll fail to do that here. Of course, this should be something like this. Uh, so I'll, I'll draw the partition 4 to 1, the same example that I drew before, diagonally like this, 4 to 1. And then on, on the z, this is the z plus 1 half axis, uh, simply because I want things to be symmetric, so this square root business here and this 1 half here are immaterial. Whenever I have an up step, I put a hole, and whenever I have a down step, I put a particle. And I do this starting from infinity. So I have a particle here, a particle, and then I have a hole, and then I have a particle, and then I have a hole, and then I have a particle, this will be a uh, whole, whole particle. So this is a bijection. I, I hope it's uh, clear for any partition. And this means exactly that. So take lambda, write it like this. Look at the particle and whole sequence. 
and look at where the particles are. You have infinitely many to the left, of course, and you have none to the right. Far enough to the right, you have no particles. And in between, you'll, you'll have these, let's call them excited particles, meaning, you know, they're not all at b below zero. And uh, this is what it means. So this is actually a deep result. And this is proven in the appendix using Fox space. And uh, using the, well, it's not a new proof using Fox space, but it's, it's, uh, it's a different take than the usual proof you find in the literature. Slightly different, not, not too different. Uh, and I, will, of course, will not have time to prove it, unfortunately. I mean, it, it's for another course. And uh, so this is always a generic statement. Once you have something like this, that you get this equality is a generic statement about processes where the endpoint correlation functions, which are these, are determinants. Uh, and this is the operator you take a fret home determinant of. I haven't told you what a fret home determinant is. That can be written down fairly easily. Uh, but I will have to erase... What do I have to erase? Well, let me erase this. Again, everything is in the notes, and my handwriting is a bit too big to keep everything on the blackboard. Uh, so a fret home determinant, you have an operator, and then you have uh, maybe I okay, I'll use z as a parameter as well. Uh, So this operator has to be trace class. For, for this to work, trace class means compact and Hilbert Schmidt and actually trace class. Uh, so it means that trace is, is uh, finite. Uh, this is usually a, a, either an operator acting on little L2 or big L2. So, so this is an infinitely, an infinite dimensional matrix. So the fret home determinant is not particularly hard to define, and I'll define it in this non-standard way. And by now, if you paid attention, you've seen such sums many times, uh, at least twice. Uh, let's see, so z, well here I need negative 1 to the i minus 1, z to the i. Here you put a trace of k to the i, so the i power of the operator, over i. Uh, what's the trace of k? Well, the operator, these are the matrix entries of the operator. So the trace of k is uh, so it's either sum of the diagonal elements if the operator is a discrete operator or integral of, uh, if you happen to have, uh, I don't know, an operator with respect to Lebesgue measure, uh, well, it will be the integral. In any case, the, it's always the sum of the diagonal elements one way or another. And k to the i, well, it's the i power of this matrix. Uh, well, this definition has the advantage that it's very compact. The other definition, well, it's equivalent. You have to write a bit more. Um, all right, so, so as I said, I will not give the proof of this. Uh, but the proof essentially comes from the fact that sure measures are determinantal, and then a general statement tells you that the gap probability, this is a gap probability, meaning, well, Probability that lambda 1 is less than or equal to L is probability that this particle, let's say this is L, this particle is here or to the left, so you have nothing here, meaning you have an infinite gap here where you have no particles. That's what I mean by a gap probability. And length of lambda is actually this hole, so it's the probability that you have no hole 
beyond the leftmost hole. Like if this is L, that you don't have any holes to the left. Uh, right, and then once you show that this is determinantal, the gap probability is uh, automatically a fretful determinant. All right, uh, and in the 15 minutes I have, uh, I should start erasing and uh, and uh, giving you the asymptotic part of the of the statement. So let me erase. Okay, so K is explicit. I define fretful determinants. We don't need this definition. Uh, well, I'll erase the contours as well. The contours, well, maybe they can be written on top of the integral. Uh, ah, so, so incidentally, what does this mean? This also means, I'll just write it really quickly, that we have the generating series for the integral. For, for the, so the generating series for the matrix entries is uh, e to the blah over e to the blah uh, square root of zw over z minus w. So meaning Uh, right, so now it is at, at this point that my notes are important because I don't remember I don't remember the precise scaling. Okay, so this is this will be very messy. So all of this so far is true. Now I'll properly attribute the theorem so with uh, Jagannin Putia and Harriet Walsh uh, there is a similar uh, statement except not in this case so it's and uh, well by Kimuga and Zahabi which appeared uh, about a week after our result. Uh, it doesn't quite cover this odd case, but there is a similar statement in... in uh, and it also doesn't cover all this chain of equalities, but the asymptotics is uh, more or less there. So this will be an asymptotic statement. The following are all equal, so you have five things that are equal. And then... So now we're gonna do... Uh, now we're gonna specialize. Put... Uh, Theta to i minus one to be something uh, particular. Uh, theta to i minus one is uh, minus one to the i minus one uh, and minus one. Okay, so these are very precise values uh, times a parameter. I'll call this bug theta. So this is a bug theta uh, minus blah blah blah. Uh, Okay, this is a mass. Uh, I guess at this point I would have needed the slides, but uh, I'll. Uh, times by theta, and then B is. Uh, uh, well, you have some d, which is 2 to the 4 n minus 1. They all depend on little n. Little n is fixed. Uh, n to n, n squared. And then there is a d, which is even worse, double factorial, meaning you skip. So this is 1 times 3 times 5 times blah, blah, blah. Uh, 2 n minus 2. So this is 2 times 4 times 6 times all the way to 2n minus 2. Oh, yes. 
So the asymptotic statement is as follows. For particular values of the parameters, and as theta goes to infinity, all of this will have a specific limit that is actually nice and interesting to study. Uh, how should I do this? Unfortunately, I have to erase this. Uh, so, as var theta goes to infinity, and then L is equal to d var theta plus uh, plus do I divide or do I multiply? I guess I multiply. Uh, var theta d to the power 1 over 2 n plus 1. Uh, var theta d to the power times s. They all equal, so all of these quantities, of course, they're equal, so if they're equal, they all equal. This probability distribution, I denote it by 2n plus 1, it depends on n, and then it's a probability distribution, so the s is the variable for the distribution, the distribution variable. It's determinant 1 minus a uh, 2n plus 1, I guess, that's what I call it. And the determinant is on the L2 space, big L2, of S infinity. What's A, so A to N plus 1, of X, Y. So again, I'm giving you the matrix entries, but now X and Y are real numbers. 1 over 2 pi I squared. Uh, integral, so you integrate over the real axis minus a small number, oh, sorry, over the imaginary axis minus a small number, imaginary axis plus a small number, well actually the number can be as big as you want, but if you want to do this numerically, if, you, if it's too big it's d zeta, d omega, uh, okay, so so exponential. Uh, where do I want the minus sign here? Minus one and n plus one. Yeah. Uh, zeta to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 minus x zeta over exponential minus 1 and minus 1 zeta omega 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 minus y omega uh, 1 over zeta minus omega. Uh, and of course I did this backwards, zeta is the bigger one, so this is a plus, and omega is the smaller one, so this is a minus. So, what is this guy? Uh, this determinant and this, cur this kernel, so this operator, has been introduced by Le Dussalma, Jumdag and Scher in a slightly related context, which I give uh, in the slides as well. It's a slide called the comparison between our result and that of the Dussalma, Jumdag and Scherz. So, I don't know, it's, it's somewhere, it's, it's after the main result. Uh, uh, so this is uh, a multi-critical version, analog, higher order analog of the so-called tracy widom distribution of random matrix theory. So the tracy widom distribution of random matrix theory, you exactly get when n is equal to 1. 
when n is equal to 1, the result on partitions is called the byte dash johansson theorem. And there are some remarks in the notes about this. And uh, the result on random matrices, well, it's actually not on these. Uh, so there, there's a. Right, and the result on, on the random matrix side that Tracy and Widom proved is about GUE random matrices. So I won't define GUE, but they're essentially, uh, okay, I'll define it, Hermitian matrices, random Hermitian matrices, n by n, which have independent Gaussians of variance one uh, on the diagonal, real ones, and complex Gaussians of variance one on the diagonal, off-diagonal imaginary ones. Uh, sorry, complex ones, uh, modulo the symmetry. And if you look at the largest eigenvalue of such a matrix, it's a real number, uh, as the matrix is Hermitian. And uh, that largest eigenvalue in a limit like this, except with n equals 1, d here is b and d are specific. And then you need a minus here. The way I define GUE, you actually need a minus here. So this is in the notes instead of a plus. Uh, so that gives the tracy widom distribution. That's more or less the definition of the tracy widom distribution. So this is a generalization. It's a multi-critical generalization. I, uh, why multi-critical? Well, without going into the proof, and unfortunately I do not have time to go into the proof, it's hard to motivate. But it's really the fact that if you just did generic parameters, you would essentially find the tracy widom distribution. Well, in some scaling, you would find the tracy widom, so the variant with n equals 1. So to get to multi-critical, you have to do some special values of the parameters, which in our case are these. And then, of course, let the var theta go to infinity. Uh, what do I want to say? So I have five minutes. That's not maybe even four minutes. That's not a lot of time. About the proof of this. Well, the proof of this is uh, it's actually written in the notes. The bulk of it is showing that k, the kernel here, which is a discrete operator, goes to a. In uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, limiting regime, and uh, the way you show that is remember k was a double contour integral. This is a double contour integral, so you do it by steepest descent analysis. Well, you essentially try to do it uh, pointwise. You take the limit inside the integral and. If you do steepest descent analysis, it actually works. And then you have to do a little work to justify that, well, k is trace class and decays properly so that, that you can interchange limit and integral by dominated convergence. The bulk of the proof is showing that k goes to a. That's not enough to show the convergence in distribution here. You actually have to show that the trace of k goes to the trace of a. And uh, the, the proof is similar. It's, it's more or less the same proof that k goes to a. Well, I should say, no. k does not, so in the, in the limit, k doesn't go to a, k goes to 0. So you have to multiply k by, you have to renormalize k by something, by essentially this number. If you renormalize k by this number, then indeed goes to, goes to, the, goes to a. This is written in the notes. Uh, so that's the proof. Now let me. Let me mention how Le Dussal, Majundar, and Scher obtained their result, uh, obtained this kernel in, a, in another model. Uh, and then I'm actually finished. Uh, so they considered uh, this is sort of physics. Uh, well, well, so 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 they, they they found it in a physics model in a in in the following Schrodinger Schrodinger picture. Look at this uh, Hamiltonian. G G is a number that's bigger than zero. Uh, X to the two n. Uh, take its. Uh, Take its uh, Fourier transform, so that's going to be uh, p squared 
look up on Wikipedia, I guess, for the right conventions of Fourier transform that I'm using, because I, I don't know myself. I don't remember. Uh, minus 1 to the n, I guess. G. And then you have the Laplacian in, uh, well, not the Laplacian, but you have the derivative in P, the 2 nth derivative in P. Look at this operator. This operator has discrete spectrum with uh, positive energies. And look at n particles that are independent in, uh, in this potential, h, h uh, hat. Uh, what that precisely means, so that's the Slater picture, is in the notes. So look at n particles in this potential. Those particles have momenta, p1, p2, pn, because there are n of them. And as n goes to infinity, you have the same picture. So let the Salma and Dragon Shah look, look at the system on, of n free fermions, uh, fermions because of determinants, where the one particle Hamiltonian is this. So there is a way to make that precise. It's, it's well known in the physics literature and even in the mathematical literature. And uh, that's what they found. And unfortunately, I will have to stop here. And uh, well, everything is in the notes. I probably covered seven slides of the 50. So take a look at the notes. And uh, well, I guess I'm not in the picture anymore. I keep forgetting. But thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dan. Um, so let's see if there are any questions from the audience. Otherwise, I may have uh, one or two. But okay, so people can ask questions in the chat, and meanwhile, I will ask my question. Um, so this multicritical uh, variant of the trace freedom distribution, uh, can you does it appear as the asymptotic distribution of the top eigenvalue of some matrix model? That is a good question, and uh, the answer is uh, we don't know because so for n equals one, the Hermitian matrix picture, the Schrödinger picture. The Hermitian matrix picture and the Schrodinger picture, with or without the Fourier transform, it doesn't matter because for n equals one, you get the same Hamiltonian essentially, are the same. So, so for n equals one, that's true. But for n greater than one, it is not, for example, true that. Uh, that uh, well, okay. No, let, let me not let me not go into into that much detail. For any for n greater than one, I don't know. Uh, it, it's not written. S similar higher order generalizations of the Tracy Widom distribution do appear, but they're more complicated. They're not as simple as this. Uh, there's a paper of uh, Kleis, uh, Tom Kleis, uh, Alexander Gitz, and Krasovsky from 2010 in CPAM where uh, they give similar higher order generalizations, but they don't have neat expressions like these. There are certain solutions of so-called uh, Panleve 2 uh, equations, higher order Panleve 2 equations, more complicated than these. These are also solutions of that thing. Uh, and those indeed come from, from uh, Hermitian uh, matrix models, but, but it's not the same thing. Uh, so, so for n greater than one, you you lose the random matrix picture, the, the Hermitian random matrix picture here. But of course, you still have the unitary matrix picture. Well, this expectation business uh, still holds because of well, because the, all these five things are equal. Uh, Thank you. I don't see question in questions in the chat, but I have a, another one. Um, so you you define these show functions as determinants of uh, either the HK or the EK 
depending on parameters uh, theta. But usually one defines uh, show functions as uh, symmetric functions of a certain set of variables. So how does it relate uh, to the thetas? For, for, for a given sequence of theta as you choose, can you uh, find uh, paramet symmetric parameters for the show function that they correspond to? Uh, yes. So this is actually written in the notes, except I don't know which uh, which uh, slide, well, it's probably on several slides. Uh, let me erase everything. Well, let me erase maybe a corner. So sure functions are, I didn't tell you this, but sure functions are symmetric functions. And the theta i's are essentially, any symmetric function can be written in terms of the power sum symmetric functions, the sum of x i to the k, sum over all i. And the theta i's are essentially the values you assign, you assign to the power sums. But, so what that means is that, well, there is a definition in the notes of sure functions in terms of variables. And I'll write this like this with round parentheses. And I had, so these are possibly infinitely many variables. And I had, uh, I had something like this with uh, square parentheses. Theta 1, theta 2. Uh, so, so what's, what's the relation between the two? When are these two equal? Well, the relation is the following. 1 over 1 minus x i z i is equal to e sum theta i over i. So this is i greater than or equal to 1. Uh, okay, let me put a k here. Uh, z to the i. Uh, so if you have only finitely many things here that are, that are non-zero and all of the other thetas are zero, you will need infinitely many variables for this to work. And uh, they, they, won't, they won't be all positive. But uh, if you know sure functions as symmetric functions in a bunch of variables, maybe because they're characters of the unitary group and you have the vial formula, which is uh, the more common definition of sure functions, or maybe as generating series over semi-standard Yang tableau. Uh, these are these are the variables. Uh, this is of course in the notes, and you can even define. So I define the sure functions as determinants of these guys. What are these? You can write this as z lambda product theta lambda i lambda is equal to k. So as sum over partitions of size k, I forget whether it's z lambda or z lambda inverse. And what's z lambda? z lambda is product i to the k, uh, i to the mi, mi factorial, mi is equal to number of i in lambda. So lambda has parts, 4 to 1, so for example in the partition 4 to 1, the number of parts of 4 is 1, because you only have 1 4. So 4 to 1, m4 is equal to 1, you only have one part, m3 is equal to 0. So indeed, you can write the h case in terms of the theta i's, and this is in the notes. And then this, by the way, just follows from, uh, well, I haven't thought about this, but it should follow from this expansion. There is uh, one question uh, in the chat from Mattia. Uh, the identity between the four object and on the other side, the Freedom determinant, uh, can this be proven using the borodino kunkov formula? Uh, so, the identity equals uh, tuplets, tuplets equals Fredholm? Uh, 
the identity between on one side the four things and on the other side the Freudian determinant. So, so, so what I what I, what I gave behind the scenes is the proof of the Borodino Kunkov formula. So this is the proof of the Borodino Kunkov formula, and also there are some uh, remarks about the Sergio theorem. Again, it's all in the slides, maybe slide six or seven. Uh, module of the fact that sure functions are determinantal, and that's how Borodino Kunkov proved their formula. Once you show that sure functions are determinantal, the Borodino Kunkov formula just is the proof of it is exactly what I gave you here. And to show that sure functions are determinantal, well, this is in the uh, appendix of the slides. And it's all Okunkov's work. Modulo some uh, liberties I took with uh, computations myself. Let's put it that way. But yeah, it's essentially Okunkov. Uh, yeah, so the answer is yes. And in fact, you've seen the proof in, in, uh, in, in this, uh, yeah, in this course. Okay, uh, so I don't see uh, any further question in the chat, uh, but uh, thank you, uh, Dan, for uh, for this mini course, and uh, I applaud you uh, again. Uh, first, I'm, I'm here alone in the room, so it's not so impressive. <laughs> <laughs>